Hi, good evening and welcome. Welcome to Talk, Listen and Share. For the past several years, genetic testing has been on the rise for many diseases, including cancer. Today, I, Jeannie Parafan, um, will be speaking with our specialist, Dr. Christopher Hancock, um, Director of Neuroradiology at Halo Diagnostics and Genetic Testing for Cancer Markers. Shays Warriors is a 501c3 nonprofit with all volunteer board of directors that was formed in the Coachella Valley to help our cancer community thrive after treatment is over. The mission of Shays Warriors is to inspire, inform, and empower through health, fitness, mind, body, connection. It's to heal survivors and their families, families through a network of support. So tonight we have Dr. Sonia Fong with us, Dr. Amy Hetherington, all board members and volunteers. And then we have Dr. Hancock who will be speaking on our topic tonight. Dr. Hancock completed his undergraduate training in genetics at the University of Georgia, graduating Kuma, I'm sorry, summa cum laude, and then earned a medical degree from the Medical College of Georgia while conducting two years of stem cell neurodevelopment research. He completed a residency and fellowship in diagnostics radiology at the University of Miami and is a board certified in diagnostic radiology and neuroradiology by the American Board of Radiology. He was the director of neuroradiology at Mount Sinai Medical Center and also received his MBA in healthcare at UCI. Currently, Dr. Hancock leads the neuroscience division at Halo Diagnostics Innovation Center is the director of neuroradiology at Halo Diagnostic Desert Cities and is an assistant clinical associate, I'm sorry, an assistant clinical professor of radiology at the University of California, Riverside. Dr. Hancock is a reviewer for multiple medical journals, is a committee member of the Coachella Radiolo Radiological, gosh, I had to get that word out, society and a board member of Desert Doctors. So with that, um, and his amazing credentials and the wealth of knowledge that uh, he brings to not only the Coachella Valley and the patients, but he's here to uh, share it with us today. So thank you, Dr. Hancock, for joining us and take it from there. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you, team. Thank you, warriors. Uh, I love to hear that word, warriors. We're going to fight cancer. We're going to win. Um, tonight, I'm going to talk about finding cancer before it's too late, right? That's our goal and specifically the multi-omics approach, our approach, uh, the approach that I think is gonna be best for our patients going forward. And how are we gonna do that? You know, a multi-omics, I'll get into it as an intro here in a second, but the idea of taking all the different types of medical tests that you could possibly imagine and crunching those with machine learning, artificial intelligence algorithms. We've all seen ChatGPT, we've seen the large language models that are out there and what they can do. As a matter of fact, the picture that you see here was painted by uh, OpenAI and it's Dale. So you can go online, you can do this yourself. Probably many of you have done this. And I, I asked it to talk about, to present an impressionistic painting of the complexities of treating cancer and diagnosing cancer. And this is the artwork. I think it's fantastic. Um, and I've done this for many talks in the past, um, and I hope to do it in the future as well. But the idea of what are the complexities? How do we create something from that and take care of our patients. So we've got a little intro for us and uh, the outline on your left is multi-omics intro. We'll go into diagnostic accuracy, cancer statistics, medical imaging, biopsy, histopathology, proteomics, and genomics, hereditary genomics, and cell-free DNA. And then we're even going to talk a little bit about some of the DNA editing. If you look to your right, this was a paper that came out a couple of years ago in Nature Journal, one of our most prestigious journals. And they said, we can take an individual cell now and we can look at the multi-omics of the individual cell. And we're talking to humans, say 30 to 40 trillion cells. You could take a cell and look at it. And what can you actually do with that cell? This is also from the paper. You could look at the genome, the transcriptome, the epigenome, the proteomes, or start looking at some of these components that are within the cell. So let's talk about the multiome. What do we mean by this? So back in 1888, uh, some of the first you know, scientists were looking under the microscope and they get higher, higher resolution and they could see inside the nucleus and they saw these colorful bodies. And these chromosomes are these colorful bodies. And they came up with the idea, well, this is the body of genomics. And so a couple decades later, they came up with the idea of the genome. And then maybe, you know, 80 years later, they come up with the proteome. So the proteins that come from the code that is the genome. And then, you know, the past couple decades, it's really just really ramped up. So we talk about the transcriptome and the epigenome, the metabolome, the 
lipidome, the metagenome, that's actually looking at the genomics of the things that are in and on you, right? So we actually have more other things in and on us as a number, not size, but number. So you think about if we have 30 to 40 trillion cells, you're thinking even more of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and archaea. You know, think about your bowel movements, of course, right? And the metatranscriptome looks at that, and they all kind of play together. We've all heard about leaky gut syndrome that's associated with some of the residents inside of our bowel. Me being a radiologist, uh, about a decade ago, we started talking about radiomics. And so when you think about radiology, trying to diagnose a disease state, you might think about a radiograph, a mammogram, ultrasound, CT, MRI, PET-CT. Those are you know, essentially photons coming into a detector. And then we arrange those with a very complex mathematical formula for a transform to create these images that we as radiologists can say, okay, that's a 2D, 3D or 4D when you talk about movement of anatomy of pathology. But if you take the source data and look at it, the human mind can't decipher that. It's like looking at, you know, just gibberish or looking at one of the old TVs that were white and black and it was just static everywhere. But you can use machine learning algorithms and artificial intelligence to look at that. And that's the concept of radiomics. We can start using some of these very, very powerful computer algorithms to see things that, say, we as radiologists cannot see. And what are some of those things that we can, you know, outside of, say, radiology imaging, we start thinking about the multiome. We first, the first, it was first coined genome. And what does genome mean, right? That's our, all of our genetic material, if you will, the analysis of that. And in any cell, you're going to have 3 billion base pairs. So 3 billion from mom and 3 billion from dad, and they come together and create base pairs. So how on earth would you ever look at those without some type of very powerful computing program? It's almost impossible, right? And the protein coding in genes is thought, in, you know, over 19,000 to 20,000 human protein encoding genes that are in that code. And you're looking at the transcriptome. So the portion of those 3 billion base pairs that you look at to create the proteins, you're looking at about 60 million base pairs, okay? And then the exons, these like chunks of that coding DNA, we're looking at say half a million, a little more than half a million of those. Now, if you slice and dice those, some other people think it's not just say 19 to 20,000 proteins we're looking at, we're, we may be looking at more like 6 million protein species depending how they're processed. So. The idea of talking about the own the genome is now we can actually look at it, as we all know, the costs have declined precipitously because of some of these algorithms to be able to look at these different base pairs and put them together. Diagnostic accuracy, you know, what is this? This is like, is your test correct, right? So if you get a cancer test, we're talking about cancer tonight, is it positive or negative? And is the test accurate? And what we look in statistics, we look at tests, right? You can have a, an accurate test, just like you can have an accurate test. And the diagnos diagnostic accuracy, the highest level, you want to have the true positives and the true negatives. You don't want the false negatives and the false positives, but they're there. So if you look at any type of signal, like in imaging, we typically look at these type of Gaussian distributions and you try to isolate where you're going to get your signal. Mm -hmm. And there's these tail overlaps that you can look at. And, and you can imagine this for anything from protein detecting or DNA uh, sequencing, to what's your accuracy level. Um, and there's different types of shapes of these Gaussian distributions. And for us just to kind of think about some intuition of it, you walk into a grocery store, you're in the veggie and the fruit aisle, and you look around and you go, oh, those are oranges over there. Those are apples over there. You applied a simple test, a color test or a shape test, or maybe you walked up there and you touched them, you felt them, and you know that they're oranges or apples, even though there's like different variations, right? But what happens, you know, in the setting of a cancer test? Wouldn't it be great if all of our cancer tests were like this? Like, oh, that's cancer, or and that's not cancer. That's normal, or this is cancer. We, we wish we had this. This is what we call a high statistical power test, or a high probability probability that you can reject, correctly reject the null hypothesis. And what is that? The null hypothesis is saying there's not a difference. And if you reject it, you're saying there is a difference, right? So we want these kind of tests. The problem is a lot of times you get these kind of tests where there's an overlap of your signal. And this is where you get the false negatives and the false positives. And then when you're looking at 30 to 40 trillion cells in our bodies and there's all these overlapping signals, it's very difficult to pull them apart, right? And this has been the difficulty that we've had to make a correct diagnosis for cancer. I mean, it's finding the sick tree among all of the trees in the forest, right? That's what you're trying to do before it gets out of hand to catch it early or prevent it if you can. And we've seen the numbers upwards, 18 million new cancer cases are predicted this year around the globe. 
We know some of these statistics. This is in the U.S., so we're expecting over a million cases of cancer in males and just under a million in females. And this is if you take out um, basal cell cancer and squamous cell cancer, the numbers would be much greater. We look at the male incidence versus the female incidence. Typically, males have a little bit higher incidence over time. Prostate cancer is number one for males. Lung and bron uh, bronchus is next. Females, as we know, is breast, then lung and bronchus as well. Whether you're male or female, it's a big issue. Interestingly, Asian and American Pacific Islanders have a lower rate, but still a very significant rate. And these are death rates here. So even though prostate in men and breast in women are most common, the ones that we die of are lung and bronchus, but then it's prostate and breast. Luckily, the mortality rate's been going down over the decades, but what do we want? We want a precipitous drop, right? That's what we, we want cures. And this is another way to look at that. You'll, you'll see on your left, you'll see the most common cancers are breast and prostate, right? And then lung and bronchus, right? And this, but then you look to your right, look to deaths. And lung and bronchus are highest, then it's colorectal because you're joining both men and female, pancreas next, men and female, but then it's breast and prostate. So many, many people know that breast cancer is a high killer of women, but a lot of people don't realize that prostate cancer is a you know, high killer of men, number two, just behind lung and bronchus. So let's do a, a quick foray into medical imaging. You've seen these things. Mammogram is our gold standard. Thermogram is not, right? This is actually from the FDA site. You know, some people will show these different types of medical imaging that can be useful. Thermogram is not recommended. Mammograms are. CT we see all the time, like cancer here, lung cancer in the lung, or pancreatic cancer here in the belly with a post-contrast study or an MRI, GBM, glioblastoma multiformia, as in this patient here, or PET-CT imaging in lymphoma, as in this patient here. So you've seen all these kind of things. And then, of course, there's the ability to do biopsy. Either we do it from a radiologic perspective, we do ultrasound or CT or MR-guided biopsy. And obviously, there can be surgeons that will resect the tissue, send it to our pathology colleagues, look at it, we get a diagnosis. This is what we've been doing for years. Over the past decade or so, we've been doing some more interesting things like real-time MR, so within the magnet, the patient's in the magnet, we can do a transrectal trocar biopsy lesion, the prostate, that's what we're doing here. And then you can actually, if you find a cancer, if your pathologist says it's a high enough grade, then you can do a thermal laser ablation uh, of, the, of the cancer cell. And what's really interesting is you can do real-time MR thermography. So you can heat up just the cancer cell and then you can protect the area around it by measuring the temperature and backing off of your therapy to let the areas cool down. And so instead of having a 50% erectile dysfunction rate because you've damaged the nerves around the prostate gland and a 25% urinary incontinence rate, you essentially annihilate those rates of complication because you can see where the urethral sphincter is so that you make sure that it's intact and you stay with inside of the prostate gland so that you don't dam damage the peripheral nerves. So, you know, that's what we've been doing for decades, biopsy, um, histopathology, some new interesting things we can do, MR, real-time treatment. That's some of the things that we do. Let's talk about proteomics and genetics for a second here. So proteomics, what's really interesting, right? We know that the proteins are what make us up and they come from our genome and our genome, we, you know, we are able to translate the mRNA that was transcribed from our DNA into proteins. And then those proteins will create confirmations. Well, what's really interesting, at the same time that we're having a convergence of the ability to cheaply and rapidly code the DNA, because using computer algorithms, we can also use that information and predict from a DNA code the conformation of the protein, the shape of the protein, the active sites of the protein, the areas that we might be able to attack the protein. And so AlphaFold has essentially done this for us through Google. They can look at a specific DNA code, see whether or not it's going to encode a protein, what that protein would look like, and what its conformation would be, and then start looking at how you could treat that protein. So these are some of the exciting things we've been able to do. But obviously, you've got to get the genetics first. And this was, um, here's an example um, that AlphaFold was able to look at a genetic uh, code and in less than a month, okay, they were able to create a protein structure database, design and synthesize a potential drug to treat hepatocellular carcinoma, okay, in less than a month. That's where we're at and it's only going to get faster. Some of the things that we do in imaging is things like this, this is a CT guided um, 
CSF tap. So we take the needle, we get it right into the spinal canal, we take out the CSF, then we send it to one of the labs that's, that's out there. So in this case, it's a proteomics lab. You're going to look at the CSF and you're going to see whether or not there's an abnormality in the protein there. There's actually over 320,000 of these labs in the U.S. that are CLIA certified. That's clinical laboratory improvement amendments. And that's not research only, that's for clinical use. And that's uh, regulated by the CMS. Here's an example on your, on your left as you're looking is a normal readout of proteins that are in the CSF. This is a camp, uh, example for Alzheimer's disease, but it could be for cancer as well. On the right, you see these little hazard markers. There's a patient with positive for Alzheimer's disease. You can send this off to labs and they're very rapid return around times now. So as you know, we've been doing this for decades. We can look at blood, we can look at CSF, we can look at individual uh, fluid biopsies from cysts in the body. We can also look at mass spectroscopy. Here's an example in Alzheimer's disease you can do for cancer proteins as well, where we send it off for mass spectroscopy and you actually bombard the proteins, break them apart, and they kind of do a little puzzle, put, a, put them back together and know exactly what type of proteins you have and what the concentration is. We can also do amino assay. This is where an antibody binds to a protein, wherever your sample protein is from, like we just mentioned, CSF or blood or plasma or a cyst or something like that, or urine. You, and this is a case of um, essentially detecting deposition of amyloid and tau proteins in the brain. You can find the CSF or in the blood with a little antibody that can attach to it. And you know the concentration. So we're going to switch gears now and talk about hereditary genomics. And so we all know that we have all of these uh, chromosomes, right, that have the genetic material on it for mom and dad, and they pair up, and then you get an XY, you're a male, or XX, you're female. And we can look at um, this is the hereditary germline versus say that you've got all your genetic code, and then you have a DNA mutation in the cell that occurred during your lifetime, right? So here's an example of this. Um, you can do this for cancer as well. Uh, here's an example for Alzheimer's disease. And there's a thing called early onset Alzheimer's disease. So about 1% of patients with Alzheimer's, they have hereditary genetics that deterministically demonstrate that they will get Alzheimer's disease and it will be early onset. And what the exciting thing is, well, we know where these are. And with CRISPR and other DNA technologies, we may be able to have the, act, the opportunity in the future to early on, detect these before the Alzheimer's disease has taken root and correct it with uh, DNA CRISPR and other editing technologies, DNA-based technology. There's also a thing called apolipoprotein E4, and this is not deterministic, but it covers a very high risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And so we know there's these variants, there's some that you will get Alzheimer's disease or some that you will get cancer, and there's others that will have an increased risk of getting, say, Alzheimer's disease or stroke or heart disease or cancer. This one, um, interestingly, apolipoprotein E4, if you have one allele for mom or dad, you'll have two to 300% increased risk, a two to three X increased risk. But if you have two alleles, you can have just from that one variation, it's a one amino acid variation, by the way, from E4 versus E3, you can have a 1200% increased risk, a 12, in, 12 times increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And there's similar things for many of the cancers that we have to deal with. Here's an example of something a little bit different. And I showed you on the slide before, those were individual mutations on genes that we know a lot about. Here's a situation, what we call a polygenic risk score. And this is where we don't necessarily know a lot about all the different, different uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms and variations we can have in the genetic code, but we can have these very large cohorts of patients with big data analysis. So let's say you take 10,000 patients and you say, okay, of the 10,000, who had Alzheimer's disease, who did not, or who had this cancer, who did not, who had a stroke, who did not. And you look at the genetic profiles of those two populations, then you compare the patient's genetic profile to those, what we call a polygenic risk score, because you're looking at thousands and thousands. You know, one of the ones tests we use we use 135,000 different single nucleotide polymorphisms we look at. And you're able to compare it to those populations, those large cohorts of thousands of patients, and see what your conferred risk is for PRS. And we'll talk about that in a second. Here's an example where uh, in prostate cancer, they looked at 140,000 men. So a lot of men, right? And they looked at 63 new prostate cancer susceptibility loci, not just one, 63. Um, but then they looked at the variants and they increased the variants from 147 to 682. And they were able to find another, uh, you know, almost 10%, a little more than 10% more patients that had a threefold increased risk developed in prostate cancer simply by looking at the polygenic risk score. 
So how are these tests done? You know, like we talked about earlier, like imaging tests or biopsies or blood tests. Well, this one, many of you are probably familiar with, you can either do like an oral swab test or this one is a spit test. You spit uh, two cc's of saliva in a little tube, send off FedEx, and then that CLIA lab will process the genome for you and look for the, the polygenic risk score or the redditier gene panel, the redditier gene panel being those specific um, mutations you're looking for versus like this entire SNP array that together confers increased risk of cancer or decreased risk. One of the reports would be like this report here. You can see that the report is kind of standardized. It's saying that in this case, the patient had BRCA1 gene positivity that conferred a 60% absolute increased risk for this patient over their lifetime to develop breast cancer, 40 to 60% increased risk for ovarian or, or absolute risk to develop it, pancreatic cancer 5%, and even increased risk of melanoma. And what a lot of people don't realize is BRCA gene positive, we always talk about it for breast cancer, and a lot of people know about ovarian as well, but in men, it confers increased risk of prostate cancer. Up to 26% of men develop cancer, prostate cancer, when they have BRCA gene 1 positivity. Increased risk of male breast cancer. We do know that men get breast cancer as well, right? Pancreatic cancer in men and um, elevated melanoma as well. The reports will come out and they'll confer recommendations based upon that, such as like early onset of breast examination, like in this case, start when you're 18 years of age. Uh, then a clinical exam starting at 25 years of age, getting MRIs, getting mammograms, and similar early um, breast evaluation for men as well in, in this situation. So the reports will come out. So let's think about the intuition of how this works clinically for you know some of your practices. Patients can come in the way we do it uh, at our breast centers. They come in through the breast pathway or all of our other imaging centers that come through the genetic pathway. And then we can look for these different cancers or stroke or coronary artery disease or even inflammatory bowel disease, Alzheimer's disease, osteoporosis, renal disease. Here's an example. This is a stock photo, but this is a true story of a man um, Fake name as well, but all the other stuff is uh, spot on. So 39-year-old male, family history of cancer. His mother had pancreatic cancer, age of 46, deceased. He was referred for an x-ray, okay, a radiograph of his foot due to a sports injury. But what we employ at our facilities, we say, well, by the way, while you're filling out your paperwork, fill out this short um, you know, questionnaire of what's your family history of cancer. If he picks any of those that have a higher risk, he can actually get reimbursed by insurance. Not all insurance do it, but more and more are doing it because they recognize that we catch cancer early. It's cheaper for us. It's good for us. gives us a good name. More people want to come to us. So more and more of the different insurance payers and CMS are paying for these studies if you check one of those boxes with a family history. So he was offered the genetic health care uh, pathway where he just gave the saliva sample and sent off to the lab and a couple of weeks it comes back and he's got the H um, hereditary gene panel report as well as the polygenic risk score and he was BRCA2 positive. His PRS polygenic risk score was an average risk but what was interesting because he's BRCA2 um, positive now the recommendations change it was recommended that um, at the age of 35 every 6 to 12 months he did a clinical breast examination prostate cancer screen starts at 40 um, you do an endoscopic ultrasound for pancreatic cancer starting at age 50, and annual mammography in a male starting at age 50. Okay, so this guy, he's carrying this risk for pancreatic prostate and breast cancer, also with ri increased risk of melanoma. And he also can tell his kids that, right, they have a 50% chance of carrying an inherited mutation. They can get checked as well. So that's how it would look like if he came through and like this guy did through an ankle injury. And so we found out that he was increased risk of prostate cancer, pancreatic, and breast cancer. You know, some of these stats here, um, you know, depending on, on where you look, you know, obviously some centers are much better, but uh, when you tally them all together, one in five women who are diagnosed with breast cancer are offered testing. So many patients are still not offered testing, as you know. 50 to 70% of women with BRCA1 or 2 will develop breast cancer by the time they reach 70, 80 years of age. And two of three cancer cases missed in high-risk women if they have only get mammograms without the integrated genetic testing that we talked about and supplemental breast MRI. Here's another example to kind of drive at home. Um, here's a lady, again, stock photo in name, but um, true history, 48-year-old female with family history of cancer, mother endometrial cancer at age 48, maternal uncle brain cancer 64. She was offered the breast pathway. She got a mammogram. She got their um, tyroacoustic lifetime cancer risk score, which was which was not very, very high. 
hereditary uh, cancer gene panel test and polygenic risk score. So she had the MAMO, the MAMO was negative, okay? Her TC score was 9.6%. She had a negative hereditary gene panel, but her polygenic risk score was 20, 20%. Remember that last patient, the hereditary gene panel came back positive, right? But in this situation, it's the polygenic risk score, looking at those tens of thousands of genes for little single nucleotide polymorphisms, little uh, base pair changes. And this patient uh, therefore had a recommendation to do an annual breast MRI evaluation and a screening mammogram staggered at six months, right? So this is different than standard uh, follow-up based upon her genetics. And what was interesting is that she was found to have high-grade breast cancer after six months with her first breast MRI. And so the mammogram had missed this, right? So we think that it's pulling all of these different components together under one vertical, which is the concept of multiomics, right? You've got the imaging, you've got the genetics risks, you can do biopsies, you can look at the protein score, and you can put this together with machine learning algorithms and get an idea, will the patient develop cancer? Do they have it? What stage is it? That kind of thing. So this is how this patient came through. She just came through standard mammogram, and by filling out the form and going, oh, wow, I have increased risk. Oh, I can get this hereditary gene panel a lot of people don't know about, and oh, by the way, my insurance will pay for it. Fantastic. And we were able to find cancer early on in her. And as we know, if you can find breast cancer early on, you're going to confer a 99% survival rate to the patient. And so this is what we're all about finding early on. So just to kind of summarize that, you know, the patient comes in, they do the intake form. It's just an additional little thing you can do at any of your clinics. You do the imaging as we standardly do here. We do the on-site genetic testing. So spit test and our staff helps them take that. Um, and then sends it off for them FedEx. In about 10 to 14 days, you get the results back. And if, if it, the patient needs to discuss this, they can discuss it with our clinician, with the clinician to order it. And we also have a contract with uh, a partnership with a genetic group where we have genetic counselors that can have long-term discussions with patients over time, answer all their questions. So we contract with that as well. So let's talk about cell-free DNA. What we've talked about so far was the idea, can we predict cancer early on, which I think is really important, but what about can we detect cancer when it's there? And, you know, we, we've been doing things like whole body MRI and CT for decades to find cancers, and many times you do, but what happens if it's even smaller or to add some extra value to that? Can you seek out many, many cancers that might be there in the kitchen early on, right? And so the idea is that Cancer cells are not necessarily very healthy. They die just like all the other cells do. And just like all of our other cells, they release DNA into our bloodstream. And the cancer cells DNA is different. It has an epigenome, little changes like methylations and other things like that. And you can detect those. And again, we talked about these large cohort populations. So one of the tests we employ, they looked at 300,000 patients. They looked at these different uh, projections of whether or not they had cancer, or they didn't have cancer. And what did their DNA look like? What did their cell-free DNA look like? And that their, their group is actually has another 140,000 patients in a clinical trial to add to that group of patients. So you get this idea of more and more patients. Did they have cancer? Did they not? What was the cancer type? And then you can compare your signal to theirs. And um, typically this is recommended at, after the age of 50 to start looking for this uh, circulating tumor DNA. And so they even have meta-analyses on these now. Um, in this study, if you were to read down through the abstract, they identified 1,370 clinical trials, 1129 with the FDA. So this is a big thing now. I'm sure many of you have seen this. Um, let's talk about what it means compared to what we've been doing, right? So there are only five types of cancers that we routinely screen for, right? That we routinely screen for. So colorectal, we know about that when you get a colonoscopy, right? Or a virtual colonoscopy. Lung, for those that are at risk, right? So high-risk smoker from 50 to 80 years old on average. If they're high-risk smoker, 20-plus pack years of history, then you do a low-dose uh, screening CT chest. Breast, we know that, mammography, cervical, pap smears, and prostate, PSA for men, and digital retinal examination. So, but what about all the other cancers that are out there, right? So what's really cool is this test can find about 50 different cancers. Now, is it perfect? No, it's just like I showed you that, that example early on was the idea that there are false negatives and there are false positives, but it's better than only looking for these five. It gives you the ability to find things early on and you know it's harder to find them when they're stage one, but you can find them. And uh, you know different cancers are easier to find than others. Uh, this test is not very good at finding primary brain 
tumors. Why? Because you have a thing called the blood-brain barrier. And so the cell-free DNA that comes off of, say, a glioblastoma multiforme that I showed you earlier, the most aggressive and most common glial tumor in the brain, it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier, so you don't find it in the blood. It gets degraded other ways. So it's, it's hard to pick those up. But, you know, obviously uh, you can do imaging for that. Now, we talked about earlier in breast cancer, if you catch breast cancer early on, you have a 99% increased survival rate. But if you take all the other cancers, you average them together. And if you're looking at five-year cancer-specific survival rate, you're going to increase it by four times uh, if you can find it early, right? Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but about one in two men and one in three women uh, will develop cancer sometime during their lifetime. Now, it's not normally that high. It's just that you can take out uh, skin cancer. But over 50 is the key thing, is that it's like a 13x increased risk. That's if you take all the patients older than 50 and all the ones younger, you have a 13x increased risk. And as we know, as you get older and older, that risk goes higher and higher and higher. So this test is typically recommended for patients older than 50. And, um, you know, check this number out. Around 70% of cancer deaths are caused by cancers without recommended screening options. We just mentioned there's only five of them. So what about all the other cancers, right? So we think this is a great opportunity to add something else on. So what do you do in this situation? It's not a spit test. You're looking for blood, right? Cell-free DNA in your blood. So you just get a couple um, tubes of blood, send it off to the lab. And in about two weeks, you'll come back with a, uh, with a risk pattern, um, essentially saying that they think that you might have cancer or not. And the great thing about this test is about 99% of the results come back negative and only a little over 1% come back positive. And then in the next three months or so, as you're working the patient up, so maybe they have a signal that says high risk of pancreatic cancer or high risk of colon cancer, you do appropriate imaging, you do appropriate blood work, you try to find the cancer. About half of those do turn out to have cancer and about the other half, the other 50% of those that 1% that comes back as positive from the original test um, don't have cancer at that time. So you continue to work them up and you can do another annual blood test again. Um, okay, so it's very simple. As I mentioned, you request the test, you complete the blood draw and you get the results in about two weeks. These are an example of the different cancers that can be found, things like adrenal cortical carcinoma, bile duct carcinoma, cervical cancer, colon rectal cancer, laryngeal cancer, leukemias, there's many over the here. We don't have time to go through them all, um, but you know certainly it's better than the five that we looked at on the screening test before. Unfortunately, a uh, few payers are paying for this one. Many, many, many payers are paying for their hereditary gene panel and more are coming on board. Few pay for this, this test. However, you can use a flexible spending account or healthcare savings account to pay for it. So that's pre-tax dollars that helps out some. There are some executive healthcare plans that are beginning to pay for this as pilot programs to see if it can truly save some money over time. And um, so now we're going to switch gears now. Uh, we just got done talking about circulating tumor DNA. Well, if you found something that was abnormal, whether it might lead to cancer, right? Um, you know, a hereditary gene panel, right, or polygenic risk score, could you cure it by changing it? Or can you even treat existing cancer? And so we've all heard about CRISPR. Uh, there's many different types. There's three different types of DNA editing um, algorithms that you can use. They have these protocols that you can change specific uh, DNA code and affect a result. What are some examples of this? Uh, here's an example of sickle cell disease. So in this situation, okay, they can actually take this abnormal protein as a result of the genetic code. They can change it. And so if, if, you, if you read through here, you can see that this uh, lady, Gray, she volunteered for this study. They treated 75 patients with sickle cell as well as um, patients with beta thalassemia in the trial. They said that 42 of the 44 with beta thalassemia pa patients were able to discontinue transfusions, 42 of the 44 discontinue transfusions, but they have to have all the time. And all 31 sickle cell patients were free of symptoms. I mean, how fantastic is that? And I will tell you as a clinician and seeing patients with sickle cell disease, the ones with full-blown disease, it is awful. I mean, is it like micro infarcts and large macro infarcts throughout the body? Ex Exquisitely painful for these patients, and many patients die from it. What about an example in cancer? Right, that's what we're talking about tonight. So I want you to watch this little video. I hope you all can hear it. And uh, you may have heard about this uh, little girl, Alyssa, who was treated 
with DNA editing, she had a form of leukemia that is normally about 96% of patients with this form of leukemia are treated effectively, which is great, but what about the 4% that are not? She was one of the 4% that was not. And she was given just a few months to live except for the opportunity to participate in this clinical trial. So I'll let you watch this short video here. When we first found out Alyssa had leukemia, you know, you hear all the good things, you know, she's got the most common cardiac leukemia, and like 96% of children are cured, and it's just very hard when you're that 4%. It turned out that the chemotherapy drugs she'd received weren't enough to control the disease. In fact, she'd already had a bone marrow transplant previously, and unfortunately, the disease had still come back. She was running out of treatment options, so we're looking at trying to make a new treatment for her. We've taken uh, immune cells called T cells from a healthy donor, brought them to our laboratory, and we've changed them so they can work against uh, types of leukemia that are otherwise difficult to treat. I'm feeling happy, actually. So why are you doing that? Because I have had new cells put into me. Really? Yeah. Wow. Because Alyssa's leukemia hadn't responded so well to the chemotherapy and was quite aggressive, they said, you know, we were kind of talking months rather than years. So. And we found out about this trial in Great Ormond Street that was like, you know, like a lifeline. But uh, Alyssa was already really tired. You know, she'd already had all this chemo. She had already had a bone marrow transplant. She'd spent months in hospital. So we left the decision to Alyssa. And Alyssa is very mature. Um, she's been part of the discussions from the very beginning. In fact, I remember our very first consultation when I explained the rationale for the study. And at the end of it, I asked her, what do you think? And she told me, I'm not ready to give up. I'm very honoured um, and um, it feels good to have helped other people as well. For us, this has been very exciting because it's the first application of this new technology called base editing. And this allows us to go through the entire DNA of a cell and pick out very precise regions that we want to change in a very efficient manner. I think I'm just looking forward to us all being at home as a family again together just doing the things that normally you take for granted you know just to spend time with family and friends um because i haven't been able to in such a long time This is always my problem. When we first found out Alyssa had leukemia. Do we need to restart the, <laughs> the your PowerPoint? Yeah, I'm sorry. I uh, I tried this earlier. It was able to progress to the next slide, but for whatever now, it just wants to uh, continue to cycle through. Oh, okay. So I'm just going to cancel. It might be because. Oh, oh. did we lose him? We lost him. We lost him. No. Let me make sure he knows. I'm like, I'm like did you like? I'm like. Okay, so so much great information from uh, Dr. Hancock. We'll say see if we can get him back. Uh, so I, I, I'm sure that there's a lot of questions out there. I know I have some for Dr. Hancock. Um, what I can tell you is, is that Halo Diagnostics is uh, here in the Valley. Um, the parent company in Orange County is what launched um, their DNA testing. 
And um, of course, you know, I'm sure the questions out there for many of our survivors is how is this test available to my family? And um, so um, you can certainly ask um, your healthcare provider and um, let them know you heard about this test through uh, Halo Diagnostics. And um, I'm sure they'd be happy to um, reach out and have a rep who's come and talk to me about it. And oh, Dr. Hancock, welcome back. I was just kind of sharing Sorry about, that. about how um, patients can, um, can ask their provider and how um, if the provider doesn't know uh, to share with them about Halo and you guys have uh, plenty of reps that would love to come and uh, share with uh, uh, physicians and providers around the Valley about that uh, resource. But I'll give it back to you now. Yeah, let me just start my uh, PowerPoint again. I've just got a couple more slides and uh, we can open up to any Q&A if anybody's interested here. Sounds great. I definitely have some questions for you when you're ready. Yeah, we're right at the end too. So it's just kind of wrap up. So while um, Dr. Hancock's working on that, I, I can share that, um, as a matter of fact, today, uh, we had a very interesting case where we had a patient who um, had a normal mammogram, but I um, had palpated a mass and um, referred to general surgery because oftentimes these masses, while they just may be a, a cyst, um, can be cancer. And um, the surgeon didn't want to see the patient unless it had already been biopsied and been told it was cancer. And um, I kept pushing it and it took six months and they finally MRI'd her breast and it is invasive um, cancer. So a lot to be said for um, being an advocate, not only um, uh, as a clinician, but um, if you're a patient, if you are out there and you have a mass you get it checked out until they've taken out cells and they've said it is not cancer. I think we got Chris back. Okay. Thank you. Sorry for the technical difficulties. It's okay. Um, we're, we're, we can ad lib. All right. So, uh, you know, Hippocrates, we've all heard of Hippocrates, right? One of the originers of modern medicine, if you will. And he said the clinician will manage the cure best who has foreseen what is to happen from the present state of matters. And so essentially what we want to do is we want to see everything we can from the patient currently. And that's obviously going to start with the genome. That's going to start hereditary, what they came in with, right? It's going to start with any genetic changes that occurred over time, say a somatic mutation that would confer to a cancer that has arisen. And also what their epigenome looks like in addition to all the other imaging. That's essentially what he's saying here. And this guy knew something, right? So we're talking about over 2000 years ago and he lived to be 90 years of age, right? So, and I also remember when I was a kid that there was knowing this half the battle from GI Joe. I don't know if you remember that. Um, and I, I saw this online. This is what they're saying with uh, some of the breast testing sites as well. And you can see down at the bottom, again, they say that when breast cancer is detected early, survival rate is 99%. And so for me, it's genomics is knowing. Genomics is knowing half the battle. So even though I'm a radiologist, I was a genetics major, um, like Jeannie mentioned earlier, way back in college. And so I've always had a passion for it. And so I'm super excited now that we're trying to merge all of this information together in multi-omics and bring in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so much so that we have over 50 people that are information technologists and software engineers building this out because that's how important we think it is. I mean, this is going to be the future. This is how we're going to predict cancer before it happens and stop it before it happens. Um, one other quote here that I thought was always good. Sir William Osler, one of the greatest surgeons ever, uh, he said, listen to your patient. Your patient is telling you the diagnosis. Well, that's because he didn't have all the great tests that we have now, right? It's still important to listen to your patient, of course. But I would also say that through multi-omics, we need to look at all the data. The data is telling you the diagnosis ever before. Like we want to predict things before the patient has symptoms to tell you something about themselves, right? So that's going to be ultimately our goal. And lastly, I'll leave with you um, what Hippocrates said. He said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And we don't have time for it now, but I've uh, been to a couple conferences recently, and it seems like there is a huge push for metabolic syndrome and how it's being involved in everything from neurocognitive diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease, dementia with Lewy body disease, frontotemporal lobe dementia, and on. 
as well as cancer. As we know, there's been there's been loose associations, but now there's a significant drive and evidence suggesting that it's this intolerable carbohydrate and glucose epidemic that we have that's driving metabolic syndrome that's leading to all these diseases. But that's for another time. So I'll stop here. Wow, that was that was a lot of information and great information. I'm sure that um, there, there's going to be a lot of questions out there. I, I know that I have a few. And one thing, um, you know, because you're going to be more on cutting edge of what's going on in, in the radiology world, is that, you know, obviously um, an MRI, uh, not only superior to the mammogram, but no radiation. So how close are we to MRIs being the gold standard uh, for breast imaging versus the mammogram? Well, that, that gets into um, what some of us think we should be doing, and that gets into what guidelines are. And as we know, guidelines many times are 20 years too late, and yep. it just has to be proven and proven and proven. It's like, you know, once you've got a cruise ship moving in one direction, it's really hard to stop it. It's not very nimble and you got to get all hands on deck to move it around and slow it down and turn it around and go back to the a, a different uh, different uh, destination, if you will. So th this is where I think we're going with the idea that for so long we told people to have a low fat diet. And now we're recognizing that, you know, ketogenic diets are treating people with cancer and neurogenic diseases and uh, reversing type two di diabetes, which we thought could never happen. Mm -hmm. And so, but but still, the resistance that we see with uh, some of these diet changes is tremendous. And I still see the papers that come out with a, what I feel is very erroneous information that perpetuates it. Um, and some of the things about how we think that statins are this wonderful thing, and um, a lot of the data that I see, there's a lot of complications. And what the marketing of these agents were based upon relative risk is what they marketed where, oh, you'll have a 50% reduced rate of, of, of heart attack. But if you look at the absolute risk, it's less than half a percent. And there's lots of, uh, you know, uh, side effects associated with it. So that's kind of my tangent on, you know, to answer your question, do I think it's going to happen anytime soon? I don't. Okay. And then, um, so I'm assuming with the way that you worded, um, the, the questionnaire. So if I have a patient that by current guidelines, because really all we have done in the primary care setting um, for breast cancer is BRCA. And there's, you know, there's the little questionnaire, first degree relative um, with breast cancer under the age of 50 or three or more relatives on one side. Oh, that, you know, I can qualify. So if they qualify for BRCA um, to be covered by insurance, would they qualify for that um, the tests that you're talking about with gallery or grail um, be uh, covered by insurance? No, no, currently few of any are covering grail still. And okay. I agree with you. I mean, if you catch it early, you're going to, I mean, think about how expensive it is to take care of a patient with stage four cancer, right? right. It's horrible for the patient, horrible for the family, but it's expensive for the insurance company. So I think that they're in pilot programs right now. They're just like, you know, if we have all of our patients that are 50 and older get this test and we pay for it all at once, right? They're really worried that it's just going to overwhelm them and financially they're not, they're not ready for it. That that's my impression. Um, I'm seeing the same thing with Alzheimer's disease because that's kind of the vertical I'm looking at, even though there is, as you know, a full traditional FDA approval for Lakembi, first ever disease modifying therapy for Alzheimer's disease and the FDA package insert says you should document that there's deposition of amyloid in the brain and CMS has said that they will pay for it. Still, when our patients get a referral for PET CT scan of the brain, CMS rejects it because all the independent coverage determinants, you know, are scattered around the nation. They're still like, I, we don't know how we're going to pay for this because we, you know, we projected for the this year, this is our budget for the year, and that will overwhelm us if all, everyone shows up for this test. So from what I've heard is that test will probably be covered in 2024. I've not heard when uh, Grail will be. I know that uh, they're looking at trying to get FD approval. When they get FD approval, then that releases the first strings from CMS. But then again, as we know, CMS can still delay. And it's, it's frustrating, but what do we do? We just keep pushing. We just keep pushing, publishing, doing what we can. For the patients that do want to pay cash pay, they can. You know, that, that's that I've ordered it for my parents and uh, for some of my colleagues. And, you know, we have a concierge service and a lot of people opt to do that because they're like, you know, 
for the, the, the well off, you know, what's another car, another house or another vacation or another dinner out it, once a year, I should get my, my, my blood test for cell free DNA. Only 1% of the patients come back positive. So that means that 99% of the chance I'll be clear. That's, that's a good feeling. Just getting the test. Like I'll probably be clear 99%. And then if you're 1% positive, well, let's work it up. And even about 50% of those patients come back negative or we can't detect it. And then, so you can do a repeat test. And if they want to do this test, because the next question is, what is the cash price? Last I saw was something like eight to nine hundred dollars. Um, I think it's so closer it's expensive. to a thousand. What's that? It's closer to a thousand. Okay. Um, I know that I, I say that because we have a preferred contract uh, with the company, so I think that we were able to negotiate a cheaper price for our patients. Um, so I do know that it's less than a thousand because um, we used to be nine fifty nine, and now we're we're below that through a preferred contract. But and but but you're right. So just roughly a thousand. You can tell patients a thousand roughly. Uh, but I just turned fifty this year, so I'm going to get it soon. Uh, <laughs> and so um, for our patients and our viewers, um, they're going to be sharing this obviously with their families because if they have cancer, have had cancer, this is a very big concern for them um, for DNA. What um, tests specifically, just in very short terms, are they going to ask their provider for? Because they're not going to remember genome. Multi are they going to say, are they going to ask the provider, hey, can I get this gallery test? Or can I, you know, what, what verbiage do you want your listeners to ask their primary care doctors? Well, I think that the, the, the three tests, if you're thinking about genomics, right, that we really kind of have that are clinically available and useful and that you can have action upon them are one, the hereditary gene panel, right? So HDP, if you want to have that, many clinicians are learning about it, many don't, but yeah, you would want to write down hereditary gene panel. The second one, and that's the one that if you answer the questionnaire and you have a high family risk, that then you can oftentimes get that paid for by payers. The next one is polygenic risk score. And that one is the one that I was mentioning. So that'd be a PRS, polygenic risk score. That's the one where you're looking at tens of thousands of these variations in the genetic code that you've looked at a large cohorts of patients and they confer increased or de decreased risk of cancer or other syndromes. That one is currently cash pay. That one's much cheaper though. I think that's more on the order of two to $300 for polygenic risk score. And then, uh, and that one is not covered currently. And then the third is the cell-free DNA test. And that's to actually look for not, you're, you're not predicting if you'll get cancer. It's looking for, do you have cancer at that time? And so that's the cell-free DNA test or the, um, the tumor-free uh, uh, DNA, circulating tumor DNA. Okay. Sonia, Amy, anybody on the backside have any questions back there? Yeah, for the hereditary gene panel, is uh, does Medicare also cover that? They're working on that right now. So they're trying to get um, a certain laboratory. Uh, I think it's called Moldec. It's a special type of approval. As a matter of fact, we just hired a, our chief science officer who came from a prior genomics cut, uh, company. And that's exactly what he's working on. He's trying to get it so that uh, FDA and CMS will recognize the test and pay for it. And uh, Amy um, is wondering um, about Lynch syndrome in practice. She says she's been seeing a lot of that lately. Yeah. Um, oh, so, she's lying. She's lying. There she goes. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> I can hear you. Yeah, Amy. I've been seeing a lot of, of families. Um, different generations coming in uh, after, you know, maybe an elder, one of the older members of the family was diagnosed with a colorectal cancer. And it was found to be suspicious for, you know, when you dig around in history a little bit with the family, it's very, um, sometimes if we are able to do all of this testing, we get, we can definitely be more proactive, as you've mentioned earlier, knowing is everything. And, you know, it also eliminates a lot of unnecessary diagnostics. I mean, if you have a family, if you know someone has had, is at risk for being, having, or developing colorectal cancer just because they, they carry these genes, um, 
you're probably not going to have to be reminding them all the time to get things done. You're not going to be, it, it's going to, it, it actually can be um, in a weird way, I guess, cost saving when you look at it from a, from the bigger, the bigger picture. I you do know, think Amy, that, to your point, what I think is so exciting is we've seen things like cost declines. They always talk about. Yeah. So, um, you know, like electric battery cars have gotten much cheaper because the battery prices have dropped precipitously. So, you know, a decade ago, like, oh, no one can ever afford one because the batteries are just so crazy expensive, you know, like $10,000 a kilowatt hour. Now they're $100 a kilowatt hour. I mean, yeah. a thousand, you know, times cheaper um, than what they were historically. And the same thing with genomics. I mean, if you look at like mm -hmm. $3 billion to get the first human genome, and now you can do a whole genome for a couple hundred dollars. Yeah. The prediction that I've been talking with my colleagues, I said, you know how like when kids are born, they get a hill stick because they're looking for a specific. Uh, yeah, the newborn screen. <laughs> why aren't we just doing whole genome on every kid? Whole genome, not just looking for a couple abnormalities. Just get the whole genome when you're born. And, I, I, you know, if I were a politician running for the next election cycle, I would run with that. I mean, who doesn't want to have all the kids get I mean, and And you can pay for it. I mean, it's cheaper than doing the other tests. Hancock for Congress. <laughs> no <laughs> way. <laughs> then, half of, then half of everybody hates you. And, and the other half doesn't really. Well, like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, welcome to the uh, 50 Club, Dr. Hancock. Oh, okay. All right. I'm in the club. All right. I didn't know you were there, Jeannie. Wow. I've been there for a little bit, unfortunately. <laughs> I, I and you know I did my CT coronary this uh, this morning, so um, I, okay. I checked it out again. You got to keep make sure they're clean, clean as a whistle. So I'm excited <laughs> to keep it clean. Nice little CTAs; oh, wow. these are great. All right, so um, I think um, that's all we have for questions right now. I just want everybody um, who's um, you know able to see the live stream. Uh, remember, um, this is on YouTube. I know this is a lot of information. Um, you'll be able to go back. You can watch it. Think about any questions you might have. Please feel to reach out to the team. We can find those answers for you. And uh, in closing, I just really want to thank Dr. Hancock. And he brings so much um, knowledge and information that I, I can't believe that he's not in a lab, um, not, you know, finding the cure for cancer, not just finding cancer, but finding that cure, because this is the type of uh, um, uh, personality and interest in medicine uh, that we need out there to uh, keep us all thriving. So thank you for joining us tonight on another informative TLS. We are able to put this programming through the generosity of our community partners and sponsors, all leading up to our annual I Am Hope um, Cancer Survivors Healing Retreat, where we send 50 survivors at no cost to them. So that'll be 25 women and 25 men. So welcome to November, known as Brovember, our first men's cancer month and experience. Um, we aim to help survivors uh, get clear on life after cancer and how to move forward. Uh, the women's retreat is held in June and is extended to four days and three nights um, in the Coachella Valley. Um, if you like what you're learning, please go to our website and click give to help support our programming. And we'll see you all next month on TLS. And one last thing, nominations are now open for the retreat. Um, if you'd like to- Not, yet. not quite yet. Sorry, not in. quite yet. Soon, soon. I would thought soon. Well, then, I, I thought soon. She said this one. Okay, they're not open yet, so we'll wait. But they will be. <laughs> but but you can start thinking now. about it. <laughs> so you can start <laughs> thinking about who you would like to nominate to sit on a treat the retreat um, to help survivors um, um, become more inspired and more more empowered after their fight with cancer. And with that, we'd like to say again, thank you. Uh, to Dr. Hancock and good night. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you, board. Night, everyone. Have a good one. Thank you, Dr. Hancock. Thank you, Dr. Hancock.